Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Guarantee your IT hiring managers a great return on interview. Uh, this webinar is being presented by Recruiting Daily and made possible by the incredible people at eTechy. So welcome to Return on Interview. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, first off, if you've never been on a webinar before, then consider yourself lucky and also random one to get a start with. Uh, but there are some tips on here for using your control panel. Everyone is in mute. We will be taking questions via the chat box at the bottom of the screen or on Twitter using the hashtag, if that's the thing that looks like a pound sign, R daily. Please also note that you don't have to randomly take screenshots and we'll be sending everyone who is listening a full copy of this deck as well as a recording within the next 48 hours. That is our promise to you. And now I would like to turn it over to Tim Sackett, the man, the myth, the legend, and the dude who's on that slide. So Tim, take it away, my friend. <laughs> Hey, thanks, Matt. Hey, everybody. Uh, Tim Sackett, a uh, little introduction to myself so you know what I, who I am, what I am, what I do. Um, obviously, I hack into my neighbor's Wi-Fi constantly, so I, I'm really techie that, like that. Um, the number one blogger at the aptly named Tim Sackett Project at timsackett.com. I write every single day, um, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But when you write every day, you just you, you can't, uh, can't judge very often. Um, so come check that out. Contributor at Fistful of Talent. Um, they also write great content, just kind of like the folks at Recruiting Daily. And I'm the world's foremost expert on workplace hugging. I didn't ask for that title. I was given it based on a post I wrote about three years ago that went viral. Um, if, you know, you can just Google the, you know, the rules of workplace hugging, and it's either me or someone that stole my crap. Um, so you definitely can check that out. And then, of course, uh, today, if you want to uh, join in the conversation and be smart, snarky with the likes of Matt Charney, hashtag our daily is where we're going to be at, at the playground. So let's uh, let's make sure we get that up there right away, um, and we'll get right into this. So we're going to talk about interviewing, uh, but there's a few things I need to set the table and get out of the way when we talk about IT interviewing, technical interviewing specifically. Um, and one is this concept that most of us, I think, have run into either currently at the jobs we have or along the way, which is we only hire the best and brightest talent. And you can put that into a number of variations, right? We only hire the best. We only hire this. We only hire that. And almost every CEO or every head of talent will say this. What they don't say is this. We only hire the best talent, the brightest talent that applies to our open positions when we have an opening in the market, when we have the opening, that will also be willing to accept our average pay, our crappy benefits, and our you know kind of average work environment and all of that. That is the reality at which we're facing. So before we even talk better interviews, Let's, we need to have a level set of that concept of when you're going out there and you're hunting for talent on an ongoing basis you, and you need the best talent and the best skills in each market, you better be able to provide an environment and an experience that the best talent actually wants. Um, and, and these two are very different things, right? We only hire the best and the brightest and we only hire the best and the brightest dot, 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 dot with everything at play. Those are two very different things. I have a few poll questions that we're going to throw up along the way. Ryan, if you want to jack, jack up the first one, um, just so we can kind of get a level set of where the audience is and where the crowd is. So this first one, which is, which of the following describes the technical interview as a step in the hiring presence for your company, right? Is it a mandatory at certain experience levels, is it mandatory for certain job titles, mandatory for all positions, at discretion of the hiring manager, or you know what, we don't, we don't conduct it at all. So I'm going to give you about 15 seconds to go ahead and do that um, when we talk about interviewing at, at a step in the hiring review process. I think most organizations are going to go, you know what, we just do that for all positions or it's mandatory. I don't think very often that we just kind of flat out go ahead and hire um, from that standpoint. So Ryan, when you want to pull, throw up the poll results, you can go ahead and do that. Doom, 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 doom. See, that's my, my, my guess, uh, Jeopardy. Um, yeah, hey, Tim, I, I, I can't get the poll results to go up, but I can read them off for you if you like. Yeah, let's hear it. All right, so 45% mandatory for all positions took the, uh, the lead. Yep. So it was 
close second at 24% for at the discretion of the hiring manager, 22% was mandatory for certain job titles. So th those two were very close. And then uh, far beyond that, we have a 12% mandatory for certain experience levels, and then 6% not conducted at all. So I'm shocked at the 6% not conducted at all, and it leads me to the next slide, right, which is should we even be doing interviews? And and you get back to the concept that Google came out with, and really it was Laszlo uh, Block, their head of HR, who came out with, which said, all said and done, and, and Google, by you know, for all argument's sake, probably puts more money and more resources into interviewing on the planet than anybody else, said, you know what, we're only 1% better than flipping a coin. So that really comes back to that question of, if Google can't even interview better than 1% of a flip of a coin, how the heck are you going to do it? You know, so again, TechCrunch proclaimed that the technical interviews are dead, and the question really comes back to, well, why? And th their their analysis was, it's really a bad way for companies to evaluate candidates. Um, it's also a bad way for candidates to evaluate companies, because you have to think about that entire interview process, which is, hey, not only do we want to understand, does this person fit us? Are they technically competent? At the same time, we're also trying to talk them into coming to workforce um, if, you're, if you're in a really kind of hard to, hard to reach skill set. And ultimately ends up being a waste of time and stressful for both sides, right? Hiring managers are trying to jam these into their schedule. They have deadlines to meet. Candidates who, you know, are, try, are taking time off of work and driving across town or flying in and all this other stuff that takes place. At the same time, it's, they're just stressful for having to kind of prove themselves in front of another set. And, and so, again, that's why TechCrunch kind of came and said, you know what, there's no way. Interviews are dead. It, it just shouldn't be this way. And it leads us to, all, you know, all kinds of other things that we do. There's another issue in terms of companies really having to be great at technical interviewing. Um, you know, you really have to have the capacity for your technical managers and, and the tools for them to be great. And again, it's something that most companies don't even look into, don't do. We've gotten used to the whiteboard stuff with a lot of the tech interviews, but even then, some of those examples really just, you know, don't fit the real life examples of what they're trying to do in the organization. And they tend to be inconsistent. So you're, you're interviewing the three different people for the same exact job, and instead of actually asking them the same questions and being consistent across the board and having them do the same kind of work samples, you're asking them to do different things based on what their actual background is. This leads me into this whole concept of, is there a perfect te technical interview? Can we build out this process? Step by step, and I, and I think we're going to give you some some recommendations and some options of what I think that really is. I'm also going to be bringing on uh, another pro, Cesar Jimenez, out of Miami, who is doing this right now for his company, ProSource, and in and I think there's some really good ways to get this done. This leads me to one of my favorite slides, um, and I think in every presentation you need to quote yourself, which is the goal of your interview process to predict how candidates will perform once they join the team, not how good looking they are or how much they look and sound similar to you. By the way, good looking always gets hired over ugly, just so you know, um, even though I've never actually seen that at criteria in an interview competency deck, um, it seems to always happen, all things being equal. Ryan, we're going to throw up another real, a poll question real quick uh, before we get into the meat of all of this, and that is, in the last 12 months, how many of your shortlisted candidates accepted a position with another company before technical interview was scheduled, conducted, and or the feedback was scored? So these ones are the ones that you thought you had and you just couldn't get to. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is because we're going to talk about how interviews okay. fail, why they fail. Um, and I'm going to give you really kind of what turns off great talent in a tech interview environment. And so we wanted to really check and see where, where some of this was falling off. And I think a lot of candidates, I know even in my own shop here in Michigan, we, we saw, we've seen a huge increase over the last 12 months, partly because when you're going through the recession like we did for years and years and years, I bet we would go 12 months and we would never see somebody accept another position if we had an offer out or we were getting close. Um, but sometimes we just take too much time. So, Ryan, I'll let you read the results. All right, here we go. A whopping 45% of those that voted said one to three. 
Cool. Uh, we, we have different answers here. Sorry. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, all right. Well, yeah, we, know, we know the poll question isn't up and working, so the, the answers yeah. or what I have or suggestions are different. So one yeah, to three, five percent. Yeah, we, we had to change them around the 50, uh, the, the options here. So so one to three came in at 45%, four to seven at 25%, eight to 11 at 12%, 15 plus at 10%, and 12 to 15 at 8%. So I want to know what those 10% are doing wrong. Yeah, you know, well, I, I would, I mean, across the board, here's my thing is, uh, and, and my team just, I mean, I know they hate me because when we go into our Monday morning staffing meetings, we always talk about this, and on a monthly basis, we might have one, and someone's just going to get their ass handed to them when I start talking about why did we lose somebody, right? Why did we lose somebody? And again, it, it always comes down, it, I mean, I, I, it's understandable that people are going to go through the process, and they're going to have things to pick from, right? Oh, my gosh, I can go to Google or I can go to Facebook. Now, which one is going to make more sense for me? But there's also so many things when you do the pre-mortem on these that you go, we just missed it, right? We failed because boom, boom, boom. And I think that's important because that's where a lot of the tech interview stuff falls down is, is these failure types of scenarios and what great talent really looks for. So one of the ways, right, and how we will um, fail in interviewing is we inter the interview doesn't match the culture of your company. Um, and we've seen a lot of this where they try to make the culture of the company look like it's just this fun, go lucky, you know, we have a slide and ping pong tables. And yet when you're walking around um, and when you go through the interview, you can just tell that that's not the culture of the company. They're trying to be hipper and cooler. Um, I have an organization here in Michigan that we worked with and stopped working with because they were trying to create this culture of an IT of being this kind of young, hip, you know, everybody wants to come here and we're so, you know, kind of with it. And they were still forcing them to actually wear a tie to work. And again, you're like, wait a minute, that makes no sense. And they're like, well, you know, we have this professional environment and you're like, you can't, you just can't have it both ways. Um, and so the, obviously the interview turns off great talent. I'm going to give you five uh, reasons of how that happens. And then the interview doesn't uncover talent that will succeed in your environment. And that's a huge failure is that sometimes we design just great interview processes, just multiple layers. And yet at the end, it doesn't do anything. So it doesn't matter what that process is. It doesn't matter how much time you spend on it. You really just need to blow it up. So I also want to tell you what turns off great talent. And so I have I have five, and so I'm not, I don't even have a slide for it, but I'm just going to tell them to you. So one is multiple interviews. When they're all asking the same questions, it's, it's just a huge waste of time, and it's one of those things that great talent just won't put up with. And that's the one where you go, oh, we're going to have this agenda, which they actually like the interview agenda. That's a good positive to have. But they don't like when I have an interview agenda where I'm going to meet with five people for five hours, and I just basically do the same interview five times. That's a complete waste of time, and it shouldn't be done. And you could be sitting there going, oh, well, we would, our hiring managers would never do that. I, I challenge you to go sit with all five next time as they interview the same candidate and write down all the same questions that they ask. That becomes a really bad issue. And if you don't, if you don't audit your own interview process, that becomes tough. Um, not getting to show their skill sets. Now, there's a difference um, that almost you know every other person who interviews, they, they, they don't really necessarily want to show, right? If I come in to interview as an HR professional, I don't necessarily need to show you my skill set. I don't. I, it's just not something I have to do. If I'm a surgeon, I'm not going to come and show you how good I cut into somebody. But when I'm a tech person and I can write code, I actually want to show you, you know, what, where, what you know, what my code is. I want to show you that mindset in a way that is actually advantageous to me, um, and not a way that you're trying to trick me. And and so that's a that's a really big one that comes out. Interviews that are set up to get the candidate to fail which I just talked about, and it's very common where we go, well, we, we want to try to break the person. We want to try to know if they really know something, and you're coming up with these crazy scenarios that you would just never see. And I've actually been in companies that we started working with and went through and sat with a developer, and even the manager would say, I, I, I couldn't even answer that question. <laughs> and it becomes one of those crazy kinds of things um, that happens. I know... Um, David Hansen, he was the kind of well-known programmer. He's a creator of Ruby on Rails, so that coding framework. Um, and he started a Twitter um, string, gosh, just, I mean, recently within the last month. 
and he actually said that he looks up code on the internet all the time. And this guy developed Ruby on Rails, but he's like going, for you to come into an interview process and force people to kind of write code from the top of their head without any really tools besides a whiteboard or whatever it might be, becomes really problematic unless it's, you know, again, if it's set up to make them successful, one thing. If it's set up this just, just to make them look like an idiot, then it's a whole other thing. Um, assessing non-life real code examples through automation, I think, is another one. Um, you know, we're going to look at eTechie later on and talk to, talk to Caesar about what they're finding. But I see so many of like Hacker Rank and Code Italy and some of these automated kind of assessing of code. And again, it's not a real life situation that you write code like that. It becomes really hard to judge somebody on their ability. And people like, you know, David, um, you know, have said like, it's just, it's not something that they would even feel like comfortable in. They would probably fail over and over in that, in that world. And then I would say the last thing um, is interview fluff. Personality tests, I'm going to talk about those brain teasers. Um, let's talk about your resume like constantly. Let's go through job by job by job. Again, that should be done in, in the screening process. It shouldn't be done when the interview manager's there. Um, structured interviews, you know, is something um, that is, I think is important I want to talk about. Obviously, um, a technical candidate would prefer a structured interview process versus unstructured. Unstructured being just, hey, so tell me what do you, you know, what do you like to do in your free time? And you always want a little bit of that so you can get their personality. But when that's the entire interview and you're just trying to be cool and hip and you know relate to a 23 year old kid when you're a 47 year old man, that never works well. So make sure it's structured and make sure you build that out for your hiring managers. Um, when we take a look at structured interviews um, versus unstructured, on the unstructured side, it really only explains about 14% of potential. Um, and then as you go back down there, even reference checks will give you another 7%. Years of experience is 3%, so it keeps getting lower and lower. So what's the best single thing that you can to and figure out if somebody's going to have, you know, potentially perform in your environment? And 29% is going to be work samples by far. And so that's really um, the number one factor. And we like to say there's no silver bullets um, for a great interview. And there might be one... And I'll say it's always good to hire straight, smart people, right? Or not, not straight as, you know, it's just to hire someone with high cognitive ability. <laughs> Let me just say that. So, so you know, and that's in second place. is 26%. So work sample is still better. But if you just hire smart people, you're, they're going to learn faster. They're going to figure things out faster. They're going to do all of that. So it's, it's really important to understand the cognitive ability and, you know, and how that increases somebody's capacity when it comes to the actual potential for your job. And so few of us um, will go out and give cognitive testing. We'll still do the personality testing. Um, and, and, you know, again, it's, some of that is, is just worthless, um, in my opinion. And, and, and also, and actually others, and we'll talk about that in a little bit when we get to assessments. Um, so what's the secret sauce? So to me, I always take a look at tech stacks, whether it's an HR tech stack, a TA tech stack. And so I take a look and say, well, what would my interview tech stack look like? Or just what was the stack? And so I'm going to start out with assessments, and I'm going to put them up front and personal. If my job is to hire smart people, I'm going to go out and assess smart people. If my job are to hire great coders, I'm going to figure out a way to go out and find people who are great coders. Um, and some of that then is gets into the second level, which is the work sample. And then I'm going to get into the more typical interview sets that we talk about, which are behavioral, situational. Um, I'm going to automate my reference checking. I'm going to go through all of this. And then I'm also going to build a consistent rubric to score all of this. And at the end of the day, right, um, we have to make sure that we're, you know, we're really still making them fall in love with us. So I want to, I, you know, I don't, I'm a force, but I, I have to have people go through all these steps, assessments, work sample, behavior, situational, automated reference, consistent rubric, blah, blah, blah. And oh, by the way, guess what? We still need to recruit them. <laughs> we still need to make them fall in love with us. And that becomes the entire, you know, special secret ingredient to this entire interview stack is how do we get them to fall in love with us um, while we're trying to assess? And that's that's the trickiest thing of all, right, when we talk about that with, with our hiring managers. So one of those first uh, things that, you know, one of the steps that we have to do for great technical interview is take a look at it, is assessments. And, you know, this is that quiz phase of the interview process. It's critical that we separate the quiz from the conversation. I hate when I go in and we see somebody putting 
the assessments on the on the on the back side, right? So we're going to go through. We're gonna, oh my gosh, you got you know you're getting this great kind of rapport and conversation going within the interview. You feel really good. They feel really good. You can just kind of tell, right? It's that first date scenario. And then on the way out, you go, oh by the way, uh, we're going to make you take an assessment. Have fun with that. And they sit there for thirty hours, or you know thirty minutes, an hour, whatever it might be, taking this assessment, feeling stressed. And the last thing they think about when they left your company was that, like, oh, my God, I just bombed this. Oh, my God, I didn't do as well as I should. Oh, my God. And they leave stressful, right? So, again, I always say put that on the front side. So the last thing that they, they, they get from me is that, you know, all the positive stuff and not this, this kind of testing, you know, kind of stuff. Um, you know, personality tests are basically useless, especially when you're talking about tech talent. Carl Jung, right, who is kind of like the godfather of uh, personality tests, you know, basically said it's akin to a, a childish parlor game. You know, every individual is the exception to the rule in a personality test. And so for you to use that for employment decisions becomes ridiculous. So Myers-Briggs, which 89% of the Fortune 100 use was actually developed by a mother and daughter. Not to say the mother and daughter can't be, you know, great, you know, intelligent people, but neither one of them were social scientists. Catherine Briggs, which was the mother, just had this deep interest in Carl and his work. And, you know, she was a housewife, and so she's like, hey, we're going to come out and we're going to do this. The reality is, is Harvard came out recently and said there's no scientific basis whatsoever for the 16 d distinctive types. Because, like, again, like Carl said, Every individual is an exception to the rule. So when you start trying to say, oh, I'm this, I'm this, it doesn't really matter. Cognitive is almost a must in my, in my book, especially when you're talking about technical talent. And when I say cognitive, there's also no re, you know, a relation there or correlation to somebody graduating with a master's in computer science or a bachelor's in computer science. We're talking about straight cognitive intelligence ability. So you, this allows you to go and say, hey, we're hiring smart people. And they might have not even gone to, to university or college or whatever it might be, and that's fine because in a technical skill set, that doesn't necessarily isn't the most important thing. But I do still want to hire smart people. Um, it's probably the easiest, uh, most cost-effective way, right, to increase your interview process and, and really kind of ramp that up. Uh, and again, I find most companies still don't do this. Um, and it doesn't mean that because someone's scored low on cognitive that you don't have to hire them. I will tell you. When we were at Applebee, when I was at Applebee's running talent there, and again, in non-technical roles and managers, we, we ramped up the cognitive really, really well. And we got to a point where I could, I could basically draw a black line on the scoring of a cognitive test and say, if the person doesn't score over this, they're just going to fail in our environment. And again, we, we, had we took millions of tests, so we could kind of bear that out in the, in the results. And it definitely made, uh, made a difference. Um, and assessing consciousness, I think, is also really important for technical hires. And so what does that consciousness mean? It's the working to completion. So it means the candidate won't stop until the job is done. And again, work with your uh, assessment companies that you work with to say, hey, we really want to go after consciousness. And we want to know that someone has that workability to kind of go through and, and get to the end. The number one thing, um, again, that, that Google found in terms of being um, a, a direct correlation to job readiness, job potential, success, you know, success within the job was work samples. And so to me, it's also the single hardest part of the technical interview, right? So most organizations skip work samples. They're difficult to establish. They're hard to be consistent, hard to score, extreme resource dependent. It takes so much time, energy, and effort to actually do. Um, and so we just, we just don't do them. We don't, and, and unfortunately, we go, oh, gosh, you know. Uh, I talked to somebody and I did a reference or I did this. Um, this is the single hardest thing to do, and, and it's the reason I'm bringing in my guest, uh, Cesar Jimenez from ProSource. Cesar, come on in. I want to introduce you. And Cesar, you're out of Miami, right? Yes, sir. So, so most of the people on the call are jealous because you have a better work environment than we do already. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to bring you in because – you obviously run an IT staffing firm out of, out of Miami, and you work with a ton of clients. And, and I think um, a while back, you decided, hey, we need something that's going to set our candidates apart from every other candidate out there. So there's two sides for me for eTechie. One is the side where, you know, staffing firms definitely can kind of differentiate themselves. At the same time, 
when you talk about the corporate side, which I think actually has more ability to be successful. Um, now you have, uh, as, a, as a corporate talent acquisition professional, I'm delivering to my technical hiring managers who are overloaded already, somebody that they have a real high confidence is just gonna be you know, crazy good. Um, I wanna start with you know, kind of what the biggest issues were that your team was facing you know, when, when you talked about IT talent and presenting them to a hiring manager, like what was, what, what were you running into? Well, oh, great question. I mean, uh, I would tell you that probably the biggest thing is, like you mentioned, I'm, I'm, let me take a step back. Yes, yeah. I've been 20 years, and I have been, you know, a little bit frustrated in the business, in IT staffing, just because a lot of the firms, you know, a lot of my clients, even current clients, even prospective clients, Hey, Caesar, can you get a little closer to the mic? Because I'm a little bit out. Sure. Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, be much better. Yeah. A lot better? Okay, my bad. I'm sorry about that. Um, like I was mentioning, just to take a step back, I've been you know, in the IT staffing business for 20 years. Yeah. And one of the things that frustrated me personally was, and I've been doing this such a long time, is that when I have a client or prospective hiring manager saying that, you know, you all, you, all you guys do the same thing. You know, all we do is provide resumes and provide resumes. And I'm also in conjunction with that, I was very frustrated with providing great resumes that that look like rock stars and then didn't know fifty percent of the skills that were based on the resumes. So one of my one of my uh most valued, I would say, uh team members on our team did a little bit of research and, and came up upon a solution to help us mitigate that risk, you know, help yeah. us kind of validate those skills and that was the number one thing and it's been a complete perception changer I mean it's been elevated our game it, it I mean I'm we're getting feedback from our clientele of you actually do something different we're not a sourcing company anymore we're actually a full service recruiting firm and it was one of the biggest compliments and we've been doing it now for the last seven months eight months now and the feedback we've been getting is tremendous because one of the things IT recruiters can do or they can go only so far, right? But the platform, the video platform that eTechy provides, it really is a true validation of the individual skill set, right? Yeah. And it also gives a, an object. What I love about the independency of we partner with a firm that's not owned by our company, that it's a true objective assessment. And that's the number one thing. So we're, we're able to provide a deliverable to our client, a resume an objective assessment and a video interview for typically about 45 minutes to an hour long video. And the platform provides a lot of features in it where you can look at stipends of code to see how clean the code is uh, that the, um, you know, the, the candidate is providing. And the feedback that we've gotten, have gotten right now is just tremendous. I mean, so a couple of my big flagship clients. No, so, yeah, so right. I mean, we're going to talk about some of the some of the results. But I'm wondering when we talk about an IT hiring manager and your like in the, that you guys run into, are there certain things that you're able to now deliver that you weren't before? And that and, and the reality is, is really everybody, no matter if you're staffing or corporate, should be delivering, but we're just not. So what are those some of those hot buttons that the that the IT hiring manager are looking for? Well, hiring managers are looking for. Um, I would say is definitely on the. Let's take a step back on the intake aspect of it. Yeah. So let's say when you take a requirement and we can tailor those video interviews around those actual requirements that the client is giving us. So one thing, the challenge that a lot of these clients have is like coordinating six, seven people to interview a particular candidate because interview is very, you know, it's, it's time consuming, right? There's a lot of different parties, a lot of collaboration. That's a big time saver. So the, so the, the time to interview process is a lot shorter. It skips a lot of steps. When you provide this level of detail in the video interview, mm -hmm. it skips maybe two or three different phone, maybe two different phone interviews going into an on-site interview immediately. Well, and I do think, because the difference between just saying, hey, Caesar, here's a job description versus, hey, let's do a real like intake meeting. And I think a lot of companies are getting to that point where they're trying, you know, a lot of talent professionals are trying to do the intake meetings. What I liked about eTechie was they kind of gave you a platform to say, as a hiring manager, let's forget about the job description. Again, we're going to put that in there, right? It's going to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. But also tell me what skills do you really want to assess? Do you need, you need to know they can actually do this 
um, and these are required and these are optional and they can go through that whole process. And, and again, most of us, and when I was on the corporate side and I thought I had and trained really great recruiting teams, they were just never really going to be able to assess that in a pre-screen. It just wasn't going to happen. I mean, you could, you know, okay, you worked at this job and you did this, but it just, it was never going to go down from that. So yeah, I agree with you on that. I think that's huge uh, from that standpoint. Yeah, a thousand percent. I mean, uh, I would tell you that it, you can go right, drill down to the, you can skip steps and go right to the must-haves, and yeah. and we can give the actually e-tech interviewer that type of questions to ask and to assess on specifically for that particular client, and that just skips the time to to interview in, in half, and that's what managers look for because the time to fill positions is it's it's difficult, especially in this current I would say in this current employment market right now, right? So yeah, the IC sure. employment, unemployment is, is, is tremendously low, so it's difficult to acquire and, and find, you know, find qualified candidates as it is. I always think that um, adoption of any technology is critical, and, and I, think, I, don't think, I think that's something eTechie will face as well. Um, you know, so I'm wondering when you started to use eTechie, and, and, and take a look at it from both your your own recruiting team and then also from your client teams that you worked with and those hiring managers what did you run into where you said you know it was hard it was the hardest part of getting it started getting it off the ground that's a great question because I was probably the skeptical guy I'm a 20 year veteran I've been doing this a while so you can't <laughs> tell me how to recruit right yeah but I would tell you that you know the um, I would tell you the biggest challenge for me personally in the in running my firm was this you know it will technically slow down the process in in a sense of, you know, you got to weed out and flush out the right candidates to get, you know, into the system, to the platform, right? Yeah. And once you put them to the platform, yeah. you know, it, it literally speeds the process up. So you may lose time in the front end, but you gain time in the back end. The quality of the candidate you present and the attention that that candidate gets from a video versus any other candidates that are presented with skip steps, they go right to the top of the pile. They go right to the top. That video is forwarded throughout the organization and to the different team members to be able to evaluate and say, this is the candidate that I want to speak to. And yeah, I know. That's what, that's what took over the top for me. That's why we're, it's implemented into our screening process right now, 1,000%. Yeah, I'm a huge, I, to me, the video thing is a differentiator already when it comes to staffing because you and I had talked about most staffing companies just don't do a lot of you know video stuff anyways right now because mm -hmm. it's a time crunch, right? If I wait for yeah. Caesar to do the video interview and somebody mm -hmm. else might already you know put Caesar into a position that I'm competing against. But for me and you, we both talked about this is such a differentiator in terms of getting your client to say, you know what, we're not even going to accept candidates from anybody else because we only want candidates accepted in the form that you're going to do it, which is the full scope, right, that we've gone through this full interview. I get this full report like we're looking at right now, which assesses all their skills, shows if they're superior, actually has comments, um, and, and again, shows if they're, if they're not, right, if they're, just not, they're not competent in it, here's what's kind of what's good and here's what's bad. And again, some of those could be optional skills, so it's not a, not a big deal. They also get – an actual copy of the video interview that you did, you know, um, or not you did, but the actual professional interviewer did with that person, and then the code snippets and all of that. I'm wondering. Absolutely. My big, my big question, right? And like you said, you and I are both 20 year vets, and so we're, we're you know, we have that kind of um, nature to question everything, especially when it comes to our own companies, which is, what about these interviewers, right? Like, are these do these people really know what the heck they're doing? Great question. That was my first question <laughs> when I found out about the product, right? So yeah. I said, you know, it's, uh, I said, so the one thing that I will tell you that eTechie does phenomenal is their vetting process is even stronger than all, any staffing company that I've run into. It, it's about a 90, it's between a 60 and 90 day vetting process. Yeah. They go through the ringer. I mean, when they go through stuff, they make sure that they, this individual is not only possesses the senior level skill set within the, that certain discipline, but they actually vet them and coach them as well and mentor them as well on actually interviewing practices. Because just because you're a great, you know, expert in a certain discipline doesn't mean you know how to interview. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what they do really, really, really well. 
That's what I love about the organization. They take that seriously. And some are just going to give you some live examples. Some of my customers have gave me comments on the interviewers selling, telling me that your interviewer that you had done for this for this project team that we we just hired from you was yeah, completely they get, spot they get on. to see them on the video. So to them, that becomes part of an extension of your team. So it's critical that they're good. Absolutely. I even got requests for that specific interviewer to only yeah. interview for their candidates coming in. So well, that's, I, that's the benefit of it. What I like about it too is that it's not like any Tom, Dick, and Harry can come out and say, "Oh, I'm going to start interviewing, you know, developers on eTechy." Like usually, it's actually no. it's, it's real. You have to have the first. You have to have the technical chops, right? So you have to actually be somebody that knows that That's kind fair. of work, has done that kind of work, um, can assess that kind of work, and at the same time, then you have to have all the other skills, like you said. So for me, that was that was one of the critical things. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the results because I know in the staffing world they're the they're the they're the last type of organization to accept any kind of technology because everything we do is money driven. If it's not going to if it's not going to give us a great return on investment, <laughs> there is no way we're going to use it. And so, tell me, tell me about the project, the Mean Stack Developer project that you guys worked on, and the numbers that came out of that. Yeah, I would love to. That was a that was actually one of our pilot programs with a with a customer that has very very high standards and and requires specialized skill sets. Um, the the important part is to also mention not just from an e techie perspective because they did phenomenal was the, also the client engagement. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's both that make the thing that that make the the whole process work right, right. So we engage with the client, and we really understand those must, must, must haves. That's the number one thing. We provide that information e techie. To give you some high level numbers, we probably spoke to about a hundred mean stack, so called mean stack developers. I will tell you through the first line of defense questions that our recruiters were able to flush out, we probably put 28 people through the, through the platform. Out of the 28 people, we only submitted six candidates out of the 28, and four got hired. So it was a it was a great return on investment for us. Yeah, no, I mean um, that's... these are long term engagements, and they were an absolute yes. And not only they got the job, but they've been on the job for several months now, and the feedback we have gotten has been tremendous. Actually, they're actually trying to solicit to actually convert some of the folks um, on a full time basis. Yeah, so the, the for a 30% fee, you're work. totally fine with that. Absolutely. You're talking <laughs> my language. <laughs> no, I mean, but it's crazy that, you know, you submit six and four get hired in that environment because usually you're taking a look at anywhere from three to five submittals for, for a hire to take place. And that's just across the board. Like I've been running staffing for, Absolutely. you know, the last seven years, and my numbers are pretty consistent in that. And, again, we always try to get it lower and lower, but it's just the nature of, Kind of how hiring managers, you know, hire. They're like, oh, I want to interview three, and then they take a look and they stack rank them, and they'll say, okay, this is the best of the three, or you know, all three sucked. I need to see a couple more. Okay, this is the best of the five. But to go out and interview six and say we want those four is just unheard of on an IT interviewing type of you know platform. So I think that's that's super strong on that. Yeah, it was a great success story. Um, we even had a couple more. And a different organization as well. Where I'll, I'll be brief because I know you got a limited amount of time. But we had another client that we were kind of like, and you know this from being a staffing guy, we were kind of like the last guy invited to the dance for the opportunities that they had, mm -hmm. and they were struggling. They were struggling. They were struggling vetting through the right candidates. They the resumes looked perfect, and they just couldn't answer half the questions, maybe seventy five percent of the questions. So we put them through the process. We explained it. We got the intake cooperation from the client. And we're able to place two more candidates um, recently at, out of the three positions that they had. And they've been working on a position for over a month. So the, the process, the platform, we're believers. It's an absolute game changer, in my opinion, for any corporate account, any corporate clients, or any staffing company. It's a complete game changer, and it will elevate the perception of your organization, whether you run an agency or you're working in talent acquisition. 
Cool. Cesar, thanks so much. I'm going to uh, keep you on because I think there's going to be some questions at the end. I'd love to have you stay around. Sure. And if somebody has some another question to follow up, we'll go there. Otherwise, I'm going to plow forward and talk about the actual interview. And I'm going to start with a, our last poll question, which is how many hours does it take for a candidate to conduct interviews using your current method of including scheduling, preparing, interviewing, you know, scoring, writing, all of that? Have you guys even figured that out? If you have, go ahead, uh, Ryan, throw that poll up. Um, you know, when we're talking about with Caesar on the corporate side, and, and again, Caesar and I are both on staffing, and so we instantly see the value in using something like this. But I also ran, um, you know, corporate TA functions for about 12 years, and, and what I'll say is that um, if I would have had a platform like eTechie as well, like I can't even imagine how my hiring managers on the tech side would have viewed my team differently, being able to to, to you know deliver that level of screen candidate. It doesn't mean you're gonna you know stop the interview from there. It just means that you're you know kind of waiting through and you're becoming that subject matter expert you know be, you know for that uh, hiring manager. Ryan, what were the results? All right, so we've got um, the winner four to six hours at 41%, and that was very closely followed by zero to three hours at 38%, and then uh, far beyond that, 21%, seven to 10 hours. Cool. Um, I, and, I, and again, I, those numbers seem a little low to me. I think as we take a look at what, what when people really analyze and dig in and do some time studies within their own shops, you would be shocked at the amount of time it takes us to go through and screen and prepare and and get somebody ready um, for that. So um, when we take a look at the actual interview and talking about questions, right? So we we have the behavioral and the situation. We talked about that, um, but really the questions don't matter in my mind. It's all about how well are you teaching your hiring managers to probe, right? So let's say they went you went through that e process. They finally get you know that live, really good, strong candidate in front of them. We already know that they actually, you know, have they have decent chops. They already know kind of what they're doing. The questions, you know, are going to be lead to one question. But if they just are answering question after question after question, they're just asking what's in front of them. They be, it becomes a really kind of lame, you know, interview process. You really have to dig in and probe and teach your hiring managers to be that. I'll say jealous girlfriend, right? That they just won't take the answer that they're being given. They're going to keep digging, digging, digging. The best interviewers I see are the ones that are that jealous girlfriend, jealous spouse. Um, and I also think you really need to build a structured kind of interview and build decks. And I know that can be really hard, uh, but if they're consistently used over time, um, you will see uh, um, an actual better candidate, higher quality candidate coming out. Um, and the alternative is, you know, is really just a highly subjective and probably more likely discriminatory if you're just letting your managers ask their own questions. Um, and also, you alleviate that the pro if you give decks and you say, okay, we're going to have five different interviewers and they're going to do five different interviews, then you can actually give them five different levels of deck and you say, hey, you concentrate here, you concentrate on these competencies, you're going to concentrate on these ones, and you actually make sure that that candidate's not going through a process that they're going to hate because they're answering the same kind of questions over and over. Say hello to my references. I told you up front, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the automated references because the science has proven out that they'll get a better response and a more accurate response. I want to introduce you to Father John, my dad's golfing brother Mike, and this is my second grade teacher, Susan. These are my references. Guess what they're going to say about me? They're going to say I'm a freaking rock star, that I, I could walk on water. Um, and about 95% of organizations check references this way, and it's one of the most useless wastes of time and resources that you can ever do as part of your interview process, especially for a technical interview. Um, and so I really kind of push you to go and say, hey, automate your references um, and, and make sure that you're going out there and taking care of that. Um, so are you keeping score? So it really, when we talk a look about the interview rubric and what we're trying to do, I love building a rubric that actually um, is based on competency and when you do that you must define each level right so what's good and you gotta let your hiring managers know and usually they're the ones building out these definitions and what's great so hey good is right here and if you do good then we're happy as heck to have you we can't wait great is a whole different level and define that out because even technical uh, people technical candidates are gonna want to know as well when they when they answer a question you go that's good 
can I tell you what great looks like in our environment? I tell you what, that will get them so freaking jazzed up about coming to work for you. You have no idea. You want to build in that kind of level of excitement. Um, and if it's not working, change it. Like, there's nothing legal that you know, says you can't change the way you score an interview. Like, we get so caught up in, oh my gosh, we wrote this rubric three years ago, and you know, we want to be consistent, and now everyone's measured the same way. Well, but if it's not working, then you need to change it. The last thing I want to talk to you about is about five different things. And it's the way, again, um, that Google does it. So these are five innovative different kinds of interviews. And I say, oh, well, if, if Google's doing it, then, uh, and that's kind of a tongue-in-cheek because, um, you know, we need to stop comparing ourselves to a unicorn, and that Google is definitely a unicorn, I'll tell you that. Um, don't try to be Google, just try to be you. So first and foremost, I'll say video interviewing. It's not new, it's not innovative, but still um, using technology to screen and then using predictive analytics and natural language processing to screen, I think are pretty cool and they're narrowing the pool of candidates. And so a lot of companies are starting to do video on the screening side, um, just on that initial knockout, because some of the predictive analytics that they're getting from um, from that are just, it's, it's insane. Um, I think you have to be careful with video interviewing, screening, and understanding that when if you've ever if you haven't done it, go out and actually do one. Go do a video screening interview where the thing the clock counts down three, two, one, and boom, you have to answer a question. You look and sound like a complete idiot, like a rambling mess. When you're actually interviewing with another real person looking at you, like on a Skype call or like on eTechy on a platform. It's a completely different experience because you're reading the body language of the other person. You're 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 seeing how they're interacting to your answers, um, and so as you as you add in um, screening, understand. Don't just look at that video and knock them out based on how you feel about them. It's a, it's so tough. And if you do it yourself and you make your hiring managers do it, they'll have a different experience and understanding of how they're going to do it as well. So what's missing from this picture? It's the old guy, the manager. It's the old lady, the manager. It's these are all the young people, right? This is the team, and so the no boss interview is becoming really popular with teams, um, and it's it's an empowerment thing as well because you go out there and say, hey, I'm going to pick three, four, five people that work for us, and in, in, in the occupation that they have to do that I know are super good at what they do. We're going to teach them how to interview. We're going to teach them what to look for, and then when they get in there. They're, I mean, it's, it, they actually then you know, are really able to kind of go through and pick people that are going to join the team and be a part of that. Um, a lot of companies have found a lot of success with that. It actually is also really good for retention of the actual teams because they just feel like, hey, I'm, I'm a part of actually growing this and being a part of this. Um, and, and also along with this is actually adding somebody on a cross-functional basis. Let's say you know you take Amy from accounting and put her into a software developer <laughs> interview. She might not know anything about software developers, but she might be the best one to, to indicate um, fit, um, fit and culture. Um, and, and she'll have a voice, right, to say, hey, I really like the way you know Mary interviewed and here's why. Um, you know, and also I just love the aspects of adding cross-functional um, across diversity and gender to the interview panel as well to actually uh, make better decisions overall. The collaboration interviews are also another hot one that's in the market right now and this is actually inviting kind of large numbers of potential interviews and then pairing them up, having them work on a problem, seeing how they actually interact with each other. Um, you have them switch partners, you have them do another problem, and the entire time the interview panel is kind of walking around, listening, coaching, watching, um, and seeing how they interact with each other in a, in a, in a, a, a really different kind of environment. Um, this is really just kind of that work sample, org fit portion of the interview, all jammed into one. Um, but it, a lot of a lot of companies are really finding this to be valuable. Now, for the most part, this is going to be entry level because if you're having 20 people show up for an interview at the same time, um, um, most experienced uh, IT professionals just re would refuse to kind of go through that unless you're going to do some other kind of of, of interview process. Um, I this is from the movie Intern. I love the extended work sample and again, kind of an entry level more of an entry level or second career kind of interview process where you go, hey, we're going to have you come in and it's under the auspices of an internship and it could be for a week, two weeks, a month, two months, um, but they know like hey, there's an ending point, this is, this is what this is. Um, and, and I see this a lot now with kind of the hacker coder camps where, we not, where they're trying to change a career, they went to coding camp, I'm not sure exactly if they're who we need, but if they're willing to come in and do an internship, for a month, 
maybe we'll find some really good diamonds in the rough. And I've talked to some companies that are doing this and just having some phenomenal success because they're actually bringing people into their environment they never would before, and they're finding some really good ones. And the ones that don't work out, they're just like, hey, thanks a lot. You know, here's what to work on. Good luck in your career. And, and they move along. And, and for, for overall, really low cost, comparable to, you know, what some of those costs are on the, on the outside. Um, the fourth thing would be the competition interview. Um, you know, and again, I've seen this work really well. I know Penguin Random House had a great study, um, but there's also some Silicon Valley companies that have done this as well, which is, you know, you actually have them straight up. It's not really an interview. It's just a straight up competition with a winner and a prize and maybe even a few job offers that take place. Um, but you actually have to create a real competition. Um, and, and the auspices is this isn't about interviewing. It's not about hiring. It's about branding. Um, it's about co going out there and actually creating some value for somebody and giving them, like, you know, a really great prize. And it's a competition. But what you find is if you have 100 people join the competition, it just gave you 100 people who are really deeply involved into their career and wanting to do better and showing their skill sets. And it gives you a great list of 100 people to go after for whatever skill sets you have in your company. Um, it also lets you show off the talent in your own company as well um, when they go after. The final one is a little bit more crazy. It's called the destination interview. And I've seen this with or, um, parts of the country and parts of the world that are struggling to get tech talent to come. And what they'll do is they'll go out there and say, hey, we're going to go and invite, and they'll go to like Austin and Silicon Valley and, you know, Boston or wherever, Chicago. And they'll, they'll put up newspapers and they'll do marketing and advertising and get on news and, and different things. And they're actually inviting then like all these tech people to come to their city and then they actually put on like a mini one day conference um, and so it's multiple um, uh, companies coming together they pay for all the, the airfare they pay for all the accommodations the food they have like a little kind of party at the end whatever it might be they bring in some really great um, technical speakers um, people that tech pros would want to see and they just say hey come on come in, you know come on over and check us out and again varied results um, there's always that you know time where they have to pitch <laughs> eventually and say hey would you want why don't you want to come live in Fargo um, or wherever that might be that they're having these but they're also um, they're finding people because what you they found was if people are willing to accept a trip to a destination and you can get them there and show them like hey this is a pretty great place to live versus maybe living in a big city with the traffic and the high cost you know now you can have the big house in, in Fargo um, people are having some really big success with it so in another kind of technical interview type ish event that's driving really great talent organizations so I have five minutes I want to do some Q&A Ryan I'll open that up to see if there's any out there um, and then if anyone has anything for Caesar or I <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, so Tim. That's great oh, job. Matt. All right. You know what? It's irrelevant. I'm I'm monitoring the Twitters and Ryan and I sound alike. Um, so we <laughs> we did have a question actually come in, and um, they were curious. Uh, how do you build a business case for this sort of technology if you, if you don't own an agency, knowing that you're going to get the type of business results that you know obviously you saw here, but you're not used to incurring that expense. Well, I mean, it's like anything, I, you know, for me on the agency side, it's simple because if I make, um, you know, a placement, you know, or Caesar makes a placement and we would just, we jokingly said 30%. So let's say it's a hundred thousand dollar job. That's 30 grand. So I, I mean, eTechie is a heck of a lot less than 30 grand per interview. I mean, it's a fraction of that. And so if I can set myself up in front of every other company that's out there trying to get the same same business that's an easy one internally on the corporate side I actually think this is an easier sell because yeah. most of the time if even if I don't have the budget if I sh if I can test it right I can usually come up with a test like let me test five candidates and then I go to the hiring managers and show them what this looks like they'll put it in there they'll pay out of their budget and they, an IT always has budget money and so I'm now just, you know, basically having them pay for a great tool that I can use across the organization. So either way, it's an easy ROI to build from, in, in my mind. Gotcha. Um, so another good question. So this is essentially like in a very structured way automating the interviewing process. Um, Sourcing is automated. 
So where does that leave the recruiter in terms of actually adding value to tech search? Yeah, well, I mean, again, that's this is that common um, thing that uh, whether it's if it's, you know, uh, SHRM or ATAP or any of the ones uh, organizations out there that support us in talent acquisition, they've been telling us for years that we need to become more strategic and th this is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> so now you have all this capacity <laughs> and you go, now what the heck do I do? Well, again, no matter what sourcing automation you have or no matter what kind of automated interview process you have, talent attraction, branding of the organization is still paramount. Like you still have to go out there and actually physically um, work to attract people to come to your company in a lot of different ways. You just can't turn on Intello and never, you know, think that you're ever going to go. I mean, I don't know if you know, uh, Matt, you know, the stats of actual, how many actual individuals in tech have their profiles or some kind of footprint online, but I'm, I'm still thinking it's probably around 60, 65%. And so you're, you're, there's 30, 45, you know, 30 to 40% of people out there in that environment that you're never going to find online, that you still have to make phone calls, you still have to get referrals, you still have to network, you still have to go, you know, to the meetups or whatever it might be, all that good stuff. Great, and which actually is a perfect kind of seek to the next question. Obviously, you know, we're talking about top talent, the very, uh, you know, uh, candidate-centric market. Um, are the best coders and engineers and, and potential tech candidates out there going to be willing to take this extra step? Uh, that not every company requires um, and, and you know kind of uh, what's that look like in terms of uh, candidate compliance yeah so the, the, here's the thing is you're eliminating a lot of other steps right you're, and, you're, and so like Caesar said and you know, I love this aspect of how it actually cuts time down where you're saying look on the front side you add a little bit more time to actually complete this and get this done but the reality is, is you're basically just taking your interview process and saying, hey, it's, it's now a two-step process. Here's our first process, right? It's all online, so you can do it from your home. You don't have to take time off of work. You don't have to fly in. You don't have to drive over. And then once this process is done, now our last step in the process is you know, an on-site interview, you know, and that's it. Whereas, I mean, shoot, you could imagine some of these people are going through you know, multiple screens, and then, then coming and then coming back again. So you have to really tighten that up, knowing that this is a big step, and there's no doubt, but it's also a real final step. You know, this is a complete screen. This isn't just some, oh, just willy-nilly, you know, tech recruiter screen, you know, that's going to take 20, 30 minutes. Yeah, it's going to take an hour probably, but it's going to be one of those that's a huge one. Awesome. Absolutely. Tim, if you don't mind, uh, this is yeah. I, I just want to add to that. Uh, I, I mean, I think one of the cooperation aspects, we had that same concern at first. Some of them were like, oh, we have to do an interview before the actual client interview. And the way you position it, even if you're on the talent acquisition side, is that the hiring manager is going to want to pursue those candidates first that already went yep. through that process than versus looking at a resume. Yep. Because they already have like an actual live feed of an interview. Yeah, and again, I don't, I don't see it as that much increase based on the screen, the pre, the kinds of pre-screens are already going through with most TA um, shops. That for me, this is, yeah, it's a little bit more of an ask, but you're also probably eliminating a couple of steps out of the process overall, which I think ultimately saves them time. Um, hey, everybody, we're almost out of time. I'm, a, I'm a huge uh, connector at Tim Sackett on the Twitters. That's my LinkedIn thing. That's my email. I actually respond. Um, if you leave a comment on my blog, I probably won't. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I write every day, so come read, and I'll, and I'll definitely do that. Um, and then also, um, I'm, I'm, I'm on the board of directors for the Association of Talent Acquisition Professionals. Check us out at atapglobal.com um, or .org, one of those. You'll find it. <laughs> and Charney, this is you. You're in. All right. Let's take this home. So thanks, everyone. Uh, take the time to listen in today. Um, I think uh, I learned a lot and I uh, hope you did too. So appreciate uh, our guests as well as our generous sponsor, eTechy. And uh, we'll be winging you a copy of the session as well as the deck within uh, the next 24 hours. So stay tuned and thank you very much for uh, tuning in.